When you live in Boston, you often hear the words tradition, legacy, and history. Here at Northeastern University, Coach Madigan and the rest of the men's hockey team plan to keep that tradition alive, live up to that legacy, and this season, maybe they'll rewrite history. I'm Joel Idelson, and this is New England Hockey Journal. Hey guys, three things, and I'm gonna keep it simple here. Gotta make sure we got all 21 guys buying in, playing to our Husky identity for 60 minutes. It's like boxing match when that bell rings, you're going into battle. We have to have the mindset mentality that every play and every puck counts out here tonight. You hear that bell, it kinda gets you fired up. And then we wanna play fast. Those three things, guys, we focus on those three things, we're gonna be successful here tonight. One of those things, a little tradition. Hey, let's have a great warm up here. Great night. With their 2016 Hockey East Championship, the Northeastern Huskies proved there was plenty of room at the top of Boston's college hockey elite. This season, they look to repeat that accomplishment and more. We're definitely a blue collar team, underdogs. We pride ourselves on our down low play. Having that challenge every night is something really good to have. You know, we like to outwork teams. And fight and claw our way to a win. We just want to be the hardest working team on the ice. Matthews Arena combines a wealth of Boston sports history with the electricity of today's student environment. Obviously, just being right by the Prudential Center, we got Newberry, all that stuff's good. Ten minute walk from Fenway, then head up to the North End. You know, it's a great school and it just seems like it keeps getting better. A lot of history here. Um, obviously, uh, the Bruins started off here. You know, when it's packed, the sound in here, it's, there's nothing else like it. Especially when we get the doghouse filled during games. The feel we have on this campus and, you know, the community, no one else has it. I'm here with Joe Caligiri at Stadium Performance in Dedham, Massachusetts. Joe, how you doing? I'm doing well. Hockey season is underway, and a lot of kids have their off-season training. What does that transition look like from off-season to in-season? Sure, as we migrate into the season, what we'd like to do is get away from the quad dominant exercises and get onto the posterior chain. Okay, well, what does that mean and why is that important? Basically what it means is we'd like to get the exercises off the stress on the quads okay. and onto the posterior chain, which is the hamstrings and the glutes. Okay, because what you're saying is in season, they're already working those quads. Exactly. And maybe neglecting the hamstrings and the glutes. Absolutely. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so we got the box squat here. We're gonna eliminate the eccentric phase. We're gonna have Aiden just sit down, all right? Take energy from the floor and stand right back up. He's a goalie, so we're protecting his hips and his spine. He's gonna explode into zero hip extension, activating his posterior chain. The important thing, goalies spend so much time in the crouch position, so leading into the season, we wanna put the bar on their back and get the stress off their quads. At State of Performance, one of our biggest things that we say, we don't want to eliminate nothing and modify everything. Lily here has an ankle injury, so we want to allow her to train with her quads or her hamstrings, but alleviate the stress on her ankles by elevating her heels. The benefit of elevating the heels actually shows that as we gain 15 degrees of range of motion in the ankle, we also gain 15 at the hips. Here we have the tempo squat. The benefit of the tempo squat is activating the type 2A and 2B fibers, which is your fast twitch fibers getting you ready for the hockey season. The off season is all type 1 fibers, which is slow twitch. This will keep you injury free and ready to play at a fast pace. The most important thing with the tempo squat is to make sure we keep a one to one cadence, one down, one up, establishing full range of motion and never breaking cadence. Leading into the season, one thing we like to do to incorporate the eccentric phase or the glide of the skating motion is the pop squat. We're gonna go down on a one count, we're gonna hold for three and pop up for one, all right? This incorporates the eccentric phase, the decelerative, and then the accelerative. The pop squat allows us to prevent deconditioning of certain muscle fibers by incorporating all of the energy systems. The decelerative phase, the downward motion is type two, the bottom phase is type one, and back up is type two again. Good. Joe, you could clearly see from those exercises, real strong focus on the hamstring and glutes. Definitely, huge injury prevention and speed development component. So if you want more information, go check out the website, go talk to Joe, tell you everything you need to know. We're at the Perazzo Rink in East Boston, Massachusetts. I'm with Heath Gordon, who's director of hockey for FMCI Sports. 
Keith, today we're gonna to talk about station-based practices, which I love because it, it creates efficiency, it keeps everybody moving on the ice. Tell us what we're gonna see out there. Typically, most you know teams have a half ice practice, anywhere from 50 minutes to an hour. So in that time frame, you wanna to try to get as much done in that 50 minutes as possible. What this allows is for you to, to break up sections of your ice into different stations to work on various skill drills. We're gonna be working some inside edges, incorporating a shot into that. We're gonna do some two on two battle drills okay. out of another station, and then the last station will be some stick handling with obstacles. Let's take a look. So I love this drill, Heath. The two versus two, we call it 2v2. What are you looking for in this particular drill? So this this is a little different than your, your 3v3 where you've got some space and you've got some uh, creativity going on. This is more reaction time, still working the offensive and the defensive part of you know the game. However, your time and space that you actually have to make a play is very minimal. We want to keep that, that play really concentrated here. So they have to think quick, they have to read and react quick. You're probably not gonna see a whole lot of passing in this one. It's, it's more or less body positioning, a little body contact. So this really kind of makes them think uh, a lot faster than they, they typically would. Goalie's definitely, again, gonna get a lot of work with, the, with these type of drills. He's gotta be on his toes, he's gotta be good on his angles. Typically with this age level, having them work in, inside edge, two hands on the stick, keeping them in a nice low athletic hockey position. Promoting little things here, head up, uh, using the stick to kind of, you know, lead them around the cone. Once they kind of navigate through the cones and the inside edge work, they got to pick up a puck and learn to just incorporate a shot just to get some you know, some shooting work in. The guys that are really good at this, they you know, they, they can stay nice and low and a nice hockey base throughout the entire drill. If you have good edge work, I mean, it's just so crucial to the skating component of the game. Typically, guys that have good edges, um, you know, not only helps skating forward, helps skating backwards as well. A lot going on in this drill. You gotta keep your head up when you're moving that puck. I think that's, uh, not, again, just about developing good habits, right? Obviously, this is a, 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 tight, a tight area. We've got a lot of obstacles on the ice. What we're looking for here, again, a nice low athletic base, getting those hands activated as fast as they can. If they lose the puck, stop, re-engage, and, and get, get their feet moving again. Um, you know, again, this is all repetition. So the, the more that they work at it and, and do it with their eyes, you know, up, um, the easier it gets as they get older. You could tell what a great way to use a half sheet of ice. It was efficient, kids were moving, 25 skaters on the ice. Everybody seemed to be working. Correct, yeah, correct. And, and similar to small area games, what we're doing is we're creating um, you know, constant motion, constant puck touches. Um, we're, get, we're kind of, everybody on that ice was moving more or less uh, all at the same time. Um, and the amount of work that you can get done and individual work that you can get done, let's say in a 25, 30 minute block of your practice time, it's, you know, it's, it, for skill development purposes, it's, it's huge. That's the way to battle, that's the way to battle. Jim Madigan has built quite a legacy at Northeastern. First as a student athlete, then an assistant coach, administrator, and currently head coach of the men's ice hockey program. Play smart. We're still going on the offense, but we got to get above the puck. We recently talked to Madigan to find out what it's like to coach at his alma mater. Coach, obviously you played here. How important is that to you, taking the experience as a player and translating that to coaching? specifically here for this team. You know, it's a special feeling to be at your alma mater and, you know, carry on the legacy of Bernie Flamin, who was our head coach, and uh, Don McKenney was our head coach. And then to try to provide and impart some of my wisdom and uh, philosophy on our current student athletes so that they can have that great student athlete experience, similar to the one that I had. We did that in 2016. It was a special group of young men and being able to win the championship. Those young men walk away with friendships and relationships that will last a lifetime. And I always say to our student athletes that when you come here to Northeastern, you know, spend your four years, you're just not spending four years here. This is a lifetime commitment. If a player comes to you and, and you know they have an opportunity to move on at the pro level prior to graduation, what kind of conversation is that like and what kind of advice do you offer them? You know, the conversation is actually an easy one to have, and mostly because I spent 18 years in the NHL scouting. And it's an easy conversation to have because we've had an ongoing dialogue before they get to that point. And the conversation is different for each of them. So, for example, Josh Manson, I had that conversation with four years ago. After his third year, he was faced with the opportunity, do I sign with Anaheim, do I not sign, do I return back for my senior year? He was our captain as a junior. So that conversation was an easy one. Josh you should go. You need to be challenged at the next level. 
it was interesting in that his dad, who played 18 years in the NHL, said, hey, you might want to stay and get your degree. He saw the value of the degree. I saw the value of the degree, certainly, but I also saw the value of, of the opportunity and hitting at the right time, also knowing academically that he was ahead of himself in school. Same time, it was a different conversation I had with Matt Benning, who left after his third year. I thought maybe Matt just needed a little bit more time, more on the physical part of it, just to get himself ready. And boy, was I wrong, because he stepped in and played 68 games in the National Hockey League right away. But the nice part about Matt was that he also continued on with his education during his three years here. So both young men will earn their degrees, but they also have the opportunity to fulfill a lifelong dream of playing in the National Hockey League. Hold the middle, Sicky. Get back! Come on, guards! Coach, if I were to ask some of the players a common theme that they hear from you as a coach in this locker room, whether it's on game day or on the ice in practice, what would that be? Doing things the right way, accountability, passion, work ethic, making smart decisions. A lot of it is not just hockey related, as you can tell. It's being a good person. You know, if you're a good person and you've got character, uh, you're going to be successful academically, athletically, and, and socially here at Northeastern. No, just get that in deep there. Come on, kid. We need you there in that spot. By and large, our job is easier because the moms and dads have done the, the hard part before they come to Northeastern. I just want to make sure we can continue, you know, help developing them as, as good people and good role models and good citizens during their four years here at Northeastern. You know, oftentimes, uh, we're talking to hockey players, you ask a hockey player what kind of player they are, they have a very simple answer. They can describe themselves as a player. How would you describe yourself as a coach? Yeah, you know, someone that is a good communicator, someone that uh, cares for the players. And here comes security. There's a lot going on in a young man's life while he's here at Northeastern, just not hockey. And I just want to make sure that they have a great experience, that they keep everything in perspective, and that if we know what's going on in their lives, we can actually help them out you know, through those difficult times when they've got, you know, some roadblocks or hurdles they have to come through. But I'm hoping the players would say that, you know, someone that cares for their well-being while they're here at Northeastern. Hey, good job. That's way to shoot that. Nice job. When we return to New England Hockey Journal, we'll take a look at the top 1-2 scoring punch in the nation. We're at Sports Etc. in Arlington, Massachusetts. I'm here with Paul Stanton, who's the owner. And Paul, today we're going to talk about helmets. So when you're fitting somebody for a helmet, what are those things you look for? Most importantly, is just it's all about fit. You want to make sure it's properly uh, fitting to a person's head, whether you get a Bauer helmet or a CC helmet, it's all about fit. That's the first and most Im important thing. And I would imagine, secondly, it's just got to be comfortable. Absolutely, yeah. Comfort's key. Uh, fit, comfort, and protection will be the third thing that we're looking for. Helmets are all uh, different levels of pricing. You want to make sure that you get a fit, fit well, uh, well protected, and uh, comfortable. I'm going to add a fourth because okay. I know my boys who play in high school, they're interested in what looks good as well. So yep. I, ma I imagine brand must come into play. Yep, definitely brand and shelf appeal is a big thing or the mirror tests we right. would always talk about. Uh, so you want to get something that's going to be a narrow profile on the face to get a, a nice comfortable look so they don't feel like they're wearing a... Uh, a bulky uh, baseball helmet. All right, so if we're going to talk about the more experienced player or maybe high school elite level, uh, what are you fitting them in? I see you got the CCM 710 here. This is a very popular high school helmet and college helmet. It's called the 710 from uh, CCM. It uh, came out about uh, six months ago. It's been very well received, very protective, a lot of great features in it. They have liquid filled pods inside of the helmet as well as uh, D30 foam, which they use inside for protection. The pods act uh, as uh, bumpers on the car to absorb some oh, of the wow. impact and help with uh, rotational impact for uh, concussion. It's kind of got a unique feature on it. It's got an occipital lock on the back of it. So when you adjust the helmet, a lot of helmets are adjusted laterally on the side. This particular helmet's adjusted on the back. So you flip this lever on the back of the helmet, and the helmet opens up and pushes in. So when you're, right. when you're adjusting the helmet down, it only it fits you uh, 360 degrees around the helmet and give you a much better fit uh, laterally as well as front to back. And then you just lock the helmet in place. All right, Paul, so we have the Bauer React here. Are there really any differences between this and something like the 710? Yes, there are. Again, fit is very important. They all slightly fit differently uh, from one helmet to another. Uh, this is the number one helmet used in high school hockey. Wow. Uh, we sell quite a few of these helmets. It's been out for a number of years. The differences between this and, say, uh, a 710, um, they have a material that's patented to their, their helmet called the uh, Poron, which is this yellow foam oh, yeah. that's designed for protection. Yeah. Yep. And they also have a thing called Suspentech, which is also made of Poron, which is designed for lateral impacts. So when this, you have this on a person's head, this will actually rotate around to absorb some of the energy when kids are getting hit from lateral impacts from okay. the play. So the bottom line is both helmets are designed to um, absorb more impact mm -hmm. and, and protect the player. 
But to your point, it comes down to fit, comfort, and protection. Absolutely. Bottom line. Absolutely. It's all about fit. And once it fits well and the kid finds a comfortable uh, helmet, I think you're good to go. The Northeastern Huskies have put up some very impressive offensive numbers in recent years. This season could be their best as line mates Dylan Sakura and Adam Gaudet are once again clicking on all cylinders. Coming in this year, we both had a lot of confidence and we kind of knew where we are, so from the day one, we we're already kind of a step ahead. And we just know where to find each other on the ice and we know each other's going to be and we're good friends off the ice, so that helps too, and we just have a lot of good chemistry going on. And Gaudet scores on the power play. The two of them are highly skilled players with high-end hockey sense and a real good compete level. And they're unselfish in that they find each other. When you put all those elements together, you're gonna to have production that comes from it. A Hobie Baker award candidate from Aurora, Ontario, Socorro has benefited greatly from playing all four years at Northeastern. I was drafted to the OHL, I think the second last round of the draft. I was a little guy. I think I was like 130 pounds when I first got drafted there, so obviously I wasn't ready when I was 16, or 17 for that matter, and uh, my brother took the college route. He was the same way, a little late bloomer as well. It seemed like the right path for me. A junior, Gaudette is a local kid from Braintree, Mass, via Thayer Academy. Growing up, I've been going to Bean Pots ever since I can remember with my dad, and it's just always been a dream of mine. And being so close to home, I mean, I see my family at every game. It's definitely something that I take to heart. I have good uh, vision. Obviously, playing with Gaudette, it's, he's a big shooter guy, so I think we kind of complement each other well. He can make plays anywhere. He's very skilled. He can make guys look silly. And all I got to do is just get open for him, and, and I know he'll find me. The two fours have a bright future, but also know what it takes to make it to the next level. It's important to kind of have dimensions to your game, and for me to move on to the next level, to be a 200 foot player is something I'll need to have. Just never be satisfied. I think that's something I learned growing up, and uh, as I got older, I kind of really took that into heart, is just never be satisfied with, with how you play. Just always want more, always uh, work harder to get more. Stay tuned on New England Hockey Journal as we look at one of the highlights of Coach Madigan's playing days that continues to elude his players today. Hello everyone and welcome to Ask the Advisor. My name is Brett Peterson from Acme Sports. This is a monthly segment where we answer any questions that you might have on the path of hockey. This question comes from Jake in Enfield, Connecticut. What are the benefits of playing junior hockey before moving on to college hockey? Hey Jake, thanks for the question. I get this one a lot actually. Think of it like this, college baseball, basketball, and football all have redshirt players to give them an extra year of development. Junior hockey is considered a developmental level for players to gain mental and physical maturity required to be effective college hockey players. In hockey, we use the junior level for an extra year or two to develop into a great college hockey player. Speak to your coaches or your advisor to identify the best league or team for you on your journey. Under legendary coach Fernie Flam and the Huskies were regular Beanpot champions in the 80s. They won the annual tournament four times. Coach Jim Madigan was involved in three of those championships. But 1988 would be Northeastern's last Beanpot title, something the coach knows all too well. Coach, the, uh, the Beanpot is such a coveted tournament. What was that like for you winning a Beanpot? Tell me about that experience, how often you might think about that, and then what it means for you as a coach with this particular team now. Yeah, so not growing up here, it was, you know, I came here in 1981 and I heard a lot about the bean pot. Then 84 and 85, we won it when I was a junior and a senior. And those were special, special feelings. They won it in 1980, they won it in 84, they are the 85 bean pot champions. We won it again in, in 88 when I was an assistant coach. And a great feeling, but nothing beats that feeling when you're a player and winning the bean pot. And you know, the tournament is just so magical and it's a social must in this city. It's an athletic must in this city. And we were fortunate to win four in the 80s. And you know, the feeling that I have are real special to it. And those are the feelings I want to have our student athletes have. We, it's been a while, uh, as we know, that since Northeastern's last uh, won the bean pot, and I want our players to have that same special feeling. Uh, it's a great feeling to play in it. It's that much more greater feeling winning it. 
I want to talk a little bit about Nolan Stevens. <clears throat> Obviously, he comes from a family that has had uh, significant hockey credentials. Tell me about Nolan. Wonderful young man, hardworking, driven, high-end hockey IQ. You know, you talked about his dad, who was the head coach of the Los Angeles Kings, and then, of course, his, his brother, who was our captain last year, young John. And Nolan's a different player than Johnny was, but a, a young man who's got real good stick skills, has a skill element, but still a grinding mentality, which he needs to have, and he's our leader. I try to read what the team needs, and I'm an energy guy, I feel like, on the bench, but I feel like that doesn't mean much if you're not doing it on the ice. Good luck, power play, Knowles. Really nice play. Each year we come in, our goals are the same. Win the bean pot, win Hockey East, and win the tournament. And we've been able to focus in on that the last three or four years because we firmly believe we have a team that can get us to that point. We establish those goals at the beginning of the year and then we just park them and then we worry about the process and just getting better each and every day. So our goal today is to get better today. We'll see you next time with a new episode of New England Hockey Journal. Thanks for watching. Gaudet. Score! Adam Gaudet up top over the shoulder. Quickly, quickly, go, get out, right here, sicky, right here.